We begin with Matt Gilkison, Chief Technology, Data, and Artificial Intelligence Officer at the Transportation Security Administration, and Paul Tierney, Senior Vice President for Public Sector Sales at Data Miner. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining me. I'll start right with use cases right up front, Matt. What are you doing at TSA with artificial intelligence, either mission delivery, back office, or some combination of both? Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, as you know, artificial intelligence is not a, a, a new thing in terms of development. I think what's new is that we've federated the access. Uh, you now have language, uh, plain language access to, to the models uh, and to the technology beyond having to have an electronics degree that you had to have in the 50s and a, uh, a computer science background that you needed to have throughout the 80s and 90s. Um, and so TSA has been doing a lot in terms of security detection, uh, looking at how we can increase our object recognition to increase the ability for passengers to uh, efficiently process and, and securely then uh, access uh, travel and transportation. We're also looking at a couple other use cases with regard to how we improve our customer experience. Uh, we think that there's a, lot, uh, a large opportunity to be able to leverage the language models to be able to uh, improve the chat uh, approach. And so we're looking at our TSA call center uh, that takes all the kind of calls about how do I pack or what do I bring or, or how do I get access to pre-check um, and, and looking at how we can use our knowledge base of information that we already have established to increase our ability for the customer uh, support uh, staff that are taking those phone calls to respond to the passenger and prepare them for travel. What's driven that federation in your view? Is it the technology that's driving it? Is it a demand signal from your folks that are saying, I'd like to be able to use these tools and so somebody has to respond to that? What, what's behind that? Yeah, there's two things I think. You know, you've, got, you've got technology that's advanced in the last couple of years that have really opened the aperture up to the average citizen to be able to, in plain language, interact with commercial models. And in that concept, we want to be able to take advantage of that to take us to the next level from an efficiency perspective and from an experience and customer service perspective. And so uh, one of the things, a really proud moment to be inside the Department of Homeland Security with the Artificial Intelligence Executive Order that the White House released last fall, it really energized and galvanized uh, a kind of congregation around the idea of responsible use, um, which for TSA is a new term, but not a new concept. Uh, since we were since we were formed, we've been we've been testing our equipment for security, safety, accessibility, equity, uh, and and performance. And really, responsible use bundles all of those things together and ensures that when you're deploying and reviewing technology, you're doing it with a lens on how it performs, characterizing how it operates. And I think the demand signal comes from the 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 need to be able to adopt the new technology, take advantage of the capability that we can that we can enhance and apply those kind of principles that, that have been outlined there. Back to why it's exciting for, for DHS is the, the, the CIO at the department has leaned in and given authority to use commercially generative tools for publicly available information. This means that we can upskill our workforce. Our, our users can start seeing how to use these tools with safe use cases and be able to start being prepared for when we can ingest this technology inside our environment and provide a more uh, secure environment for computing with, with more sensitive information. Uh, it's a really exciting opportunity. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Uh, what does what uh, you see, what Matt's talking about at TSA, how does that sync with what you're seeing as you're talking to people all across government? Yeah, thanks for having me, Francis. Uh, what we are seeing is really a staggering amount of publicly available information that's out there, and government agencies are struggling with how to harness that to forward their mission. So when they come to us, they're saying, how can we use AI tools to look at the scale of publicly available information, but also derive meaningful insights out of that to help keep people safe and secure and help government service citizens? I think it was, I'm going to guess it was 10 years or so ago that I started to really talk actively to people like Matt and others at agencies all across government about the proliferation of data that they were seeing. It was, I think, the first time that the government started to really say, we have all this data, we should get our arms around it, we should start to understand it. What you just talked about there about meaningful insights was the first step, I think, that agencies were taking. How are organizations, in your view, in government getting at being able to determine, this is what we would like to know from the data that we have, and thus, what are the tools that we should apply to it, and how should we apply those tools? It strikes me that's the first question. Yeah, right, so I think with that st staggering amount of, of open source data, 
the questions that can now be answered or the insights that can be derived is also growing. And as we get our hands around that data, I think government agencies are learning more and more that we can learn more about what's going on in our world from using that data. Let me give you an example. So recently there was uh, an evacuation in Sudan where uh, multiple government agencies had differing views on what was going on in the ground and therefore it was difficult to make decisions on what to do next. By leveraging not just social media, but pictures, images, video, news report, audio uh, coming out of that event, government agencies are then able to look back Get a, get a full view of the events on the ground, and then decision makers can take the actions they need to make to make sure that people are safe. The three C's that data people told me about in that time period that I just described were uh, collection, collation, and curation. And it sound, everything that you described about the use cases you're undertaking sounds like they fit into one of those three C's. Is that a fair observation? It's a fair observation. I mean, in order to use the artificial intelligence technology that's emerged, you really have to have your data house in order. Um, I'm the first chief data officer uh, appointed at TSA, and so we're in some ways a little behind the rest of the agencies, but we're also, I think, able to capitalize on some of the emerging technologies in a way that maybe others aren't because we haven't invested in some of the kind of capabilities that they've been developing over, over the past few years. We're in the process of putting a new data strategy out that will start getting at uh, uh, being transparent with how we're looking to organize ourselves around being able to provide access to the information. Uh, we know that that if you use your data effectively, uh, you can then adopt some of these technologies and you can provide better real-time decision making. Matt, what do you have to do to make sure that you have collection and collation right before you get to curation in the model that I just laid out? Yeah, I think uh, there's, there's some level of uh, assumption that you have to do that in a waterfall way. Mm. Uh, I think that you can do it in an agile way. Uh, I think that there is an existing data set that is available and we can start looking at curating that information now. But in parallel, we're also looking at how we collect and what we collect to make sure that it's informed and built on what we need to, to do to answer the questions that we're looking to, to answer for the agency. How do you determine exactly what those questions are? And how do you determine if the questions that people are coming to you with and saying, can we do this, really are artificial intelligence questions or whether there's some other technology or some other technique that is more appropriate? That's the fundamental question. Uh, I think the key is focusing on the user and the need. Uh, I've always tried to, in the technology world, look at what it is you're trying to accomplish in the physical sense. Uh, I keep an Arthur C. Clarke quote, quote at the bottom of my email, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I do that to try and remind myself as a technologist not to get too nerdy, right? Not to get too geeky really quickly. And it, because it's easy to do that in this space. Uh, I think if you keep your eyes and, and lenses focused on what it is in the physical world that you're trying to accomplish, the, the analog will then drive the digital. Uh, you can then start making the determination for what tools and what automations you can put in place to start making those physical processes more efficient. I've always said if you throw technology at a physical process and you haven't optimized or you don't understand that process, the technology is going to allow you to admire it. Uh, and, and it's gonna shine right and bright in your face. And so the key is trying to make sure that you're able to look at the automation components, look at the problems that you're trying to solve in the real world, and then letting that drive where you apply the technology. Within artificial intelligence applications, you have to make sure that you have the right data available. You have to make sure that you understand the performance and the characteristics of how that model is intaking and training information, but also then how it's uh, processing and, and putting out information uh, within the data set that you have. Um, I think it's important that when you're doing the training activity, uh, you know, there's a kind of industry standard that if you look at a, a really well uh, curated piece of in, a, a data set, you want to take about 80% of it and keep about 20% back. 80% being your training data, 20% being the data that then you use to expose and test and measure performance. Uh, and then as you employ artificial intelligence technologies, you really have to make sure you have mechanisms in place for continuous monitoring. Uh, because as you, get to ex as you get exposure to new, different, new and different data sets, the model's going to perform a little differently just like a human would ask different questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really important to keep those measures in place. Uh, Paul, that strikes me as maybe the most challenging thing. This entire landscape is changing constantly. New data sets, new additions to existing data sets, the things that people want to do change all the time. 
are are you seeing agencies kind of settling down with the idea of we want to try some AI and thinking more about the kinds of things that Matt's describing. Here are the problems that we have, here are the questions that we have, and maybe this isn't an AI issue, maybe this is some other technique or, or some other thing that will, way that we'll go about uh, solving this problem. I think what I'm saying, Francis, is that as government agencies get their arms around the massive amount of data that's available out there, they're starting to look at it each agency is starting to look at it through their own individual lens and looking at their own problems. How, how do I solve my challenges with this massive data set and leveraging AI? I think one of the more recent examples that I have seen is in the cybersecurity world, right? So open source data allows government agencies to get a view into what their adversaries are doing from a cyber perspective that no, nothing else can provide. Agencies like CISA or DOD or others, TSA uh, in Homeland Security are, are looking in that, at that and say, how, how do I need to ad adjust my security posture as a result of how adversaries are trying to attack us in the cybersecurity realm? So that's one area where I think they're, that these government agencies are looking at now to say, you know, how can we leverage this massive amount of available data and our AI tools to make sure that we are protecting important infrastructure, you know, our, our electrical plants, our water plants, pipelines, uh, and obviously our personnel, both in the US and abroad. Open source data really is at the core, I think, of what a, uh, where a lot of agencies are going now with AI, isn't it, Paul? Because uh, of the prolif proliferation of it, but also, uh, not having to worry about exposing the tools to security risks and other issues like that. Is that, a, is that am I on the right track there? I mean, the beauty of it, Francis, is, I mean, you're absolutely right, it, it's shareable. So if you think about in, in a, a humanitarian disaster, uh, publicly available information can be shared with state and local partners, with uh, non-governmental organizations that are assisting uh, with allies. So open source information does present a new opportunity for collaboration that I think didn't exist before, maybe with uh, information that had some classifications uh, or classified markings on it. Are you uh, at a point at TSA where you're exchanging data sets and also results of AI tools and the, the products that they deliver with the other components in the agency or with other partners across government? We certainly have data exchange with the other components and with our stakeholders across uh, the, the, the industry. Um, I wouldn't say we're at the point where we're sharing artificial intelligence results because the majority of the work that we're doing there is, is commercially available, publicly uh, available information. Mm. I think y your question about publicly available information is also important to, to consider. The large language models and the foundational models that exist today were largely trained on that public and, uh, publicly available information. And so that's kind of uh, been the, the safest, lowest risk kind of operational environment. I do think that there are some more sensitive data sets and, and more secure environments that we're going to need to try and pioneer and identify how we ingest and how we operate uh, to make sure that we're that we're adhering to the cybersecurity principles. Uh, and, and looking forward, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity with uh, the executive order and what the National Institutes of Science and Technology have been tasked to do with regard to some of the certification and testing uh, activities. When you start to expose some of those data sets that, that are currently uh, classified or whatever the categories are, um, will that mean a difference in the way that you use the tools that you have? Will it mean that you want to use different tools because of the different natures of the data? What, what does that landscape look like? Uh, it could be both. I mean, I think either way, you're looking at pulling software tools inside of an environment that's secured and separate. Uh, I think that it could mean that there are limitations in what you can perform, depending on what you're able to install and operate. Uh, and I think there's a lot of great folks that are working to kind of determine what we can stand up internal and what we can't. Um, and I think a lot of it comes back to the testing, mm -hmm. uh, characterizing the performance and characterizing the risk of terms of what we're operating. Paul, as agencies start to take the open source data that they're using, that's available to everybody, what do you expect to see them do as far as uh, governance and, and so on? when they start to maybe mix that with things that they have, for example, TSA collects a tremendous amount of proprietary data, the intelligence community does too. What does that melding, that merging of that data look like at some future point? Yeah, 
Francis, I think I think the the future is now when it comes to combining that information. I think we're seeing agencies like Department of Homeland Security take open source information, which previously was siloed and sort of outside the enterprise, and now combining that through um, uh, APIs with existing information that they have and allowing uh, people like Matt to take advantage of the technological investment they've already made. They already have tools that they're using today for their operational workflow. Open source data can be another element that could be added that could help agencies gain more insights uh, and make frankly, better decisions than what they were able to do before. We've talked a lot about tools uh, so far in this conversation, Paul. What about the people that are using those tools? What does that workforce look like today? And what do you expect to see it evolve into at some future point? What will those people be able to do or what will they need to know in order to really be effective at their jobs and to use these tools effectively? Yeah, and Francis, I'm glad you brought up people because I think uh, critical to, I mean, Matt talked about the responsible use of the models, and I think critical to any AI is keeping humans in the loop. Uh, I don't think you can subtract the human component from the AI component. So when we talk about people, I think humans will continue to play a role in AI. Uh, I, I also think that uh, um, for government personnel, being comfortable uh, working with the workforce needs to be comfortable working with AI, those types of tools, understanding really data and how to analyze it and glean insights from that. They don't have to necessarily be experts in the technology side, but really being able to ask really good questions is going to be more important now for really both industry and government. We have less than a minute left. That takes us back to the federated idea that you talked about at the beginning of this conversation. Exactly, I was gonna pull that thread a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think for, from a people perspective at TSA, we're not looking to employ the technology to eliminate any jobs. It's worth saying and worth repeating. Uh, we're looking to automate and, make, and create efficiency out of the existing jobs, allowing our staff to focus on security uh, and, and security tasks that a human needs to perform. I think the federation piece is really important because plain language allows everybody to be involved. And it's a really good opportunity to rethink some of the efficiencies that we can create out of the work that we're doing. Matt and Paul, thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate your time today. You can read more about TSA's AI efforts and find links to the resources we talked about at fedgovtoday.com.